We're pleased today to be able to announce the feasibility study on Hanmaden. As many of you know, this is an asset that we purchased a few years ago. Uh, we purchased a 30% profits interest in it, as well as a 2% NSR in the project. And the asset's been going through various stages of permitting and studies, and it feels pretty good to be sitting here today with a full EIA granted in hand. It's a permit that's been waiting for a while, and today is the release of our feasibility study that shows an incredibly profitable, robust project. It's great to finally have this feasibility study out uh, on the Hamadan project. It's been a long time in the coming. Uh, last time we really did that pre-feasibility study. Difference between that pre-feasibility study and this feasibility study, there's a little kind of subtle changes, but in the end, we end up with a lot of that same material getting mined, the same ore bodies being chased after. Uh, and now, as we get through the feasibility study, it really kicks off a lot of these other important items, like getting the EIA uh, in place and the rest of the permits we need to really start construction of this project. So this is a key point in really what we see more rapid uh, progress on this project uh, as we go into the future and getting a much stronger sense of uh, timeline to completion and future production of the project. This project being in Turkey, a lot of our investors ask questions about what Turkey is like and how the project is going on the ground and what social support and government support looks like for it. And our experience through our partner, Lydia Made in Chilik, has been incredibly positive, both at site with the local people. When this project, for example, went through the EIA process, one of the things they have to do is go out for a public comment period. During that public comment period, there were zero comments made by people in Turkey about the project, uh, which is why the EIA was easy for the government to grant. There's a lot of support at the local level with local leaders as well as political leaders for the project. And one of the things that most people don't know about Turkey is it's actually currently Europe's largest gold producer. They currently produce about 1.4 million ounces of gold per year. And the government's stated objective is to more than double that. They're hoping to get production over the next several years up to three and a half million ounces in Turkey. So there's a big push to build gold mines in Turkey. There's a lot of support for this project at the community level and it's an incredibly robust project and it is now being fast-tracked towards production. Sandstorm's partner who is building and operating the mine is a company called Lydia Made in Chilik. They are the mining arm of a large multi-billion dollar Turkish conglomerate called the Chalik Group and they have been involved in a number of mining projects before. For those of you who invest regularly in the gold space, you probably know that they're Alistair's partner on the Chirpler project, and they're also currently building the Gedek Tepe mine in Turkey, which is a project that uh, they're fast-tracking into production right now as well. It recently got its permits as well. And uh, whereas Hodmodin is, I think, one of their easiest and perhaps best projects in the sense that it is incredibly high grade, incredibly low impact environmentally. It is an underground mine only, and it does not use any cyanide. So we're really happy with our partner, Lady Made in Chilik. They know what they're doing. They have lots of experience, and it's, it's showing, and we're pleased. Here with uh, Hamadan, where we're located on the project. Uh, again, you can see from this slide in our verified deck, there is the Black Sea off to the north of it, and actually the border with Georgia. You can see how far tucked up it is into uh, the northeast corner of Turkey. Border with the uh, Georgia actually happens around there. Uh, right around here is Hopa, which is a potential candidate for shipping out the uh, concentrate. But also here is Batumi. That's another um, large port that's uh, available just on the Georgian side. The project is very close to uh, the highway. It's very close to this major river, this major infrastructure that is built. And in fact, as you really even go in a little bit closer, we even have the power lines going right over top from some of these existing hydroelectrical facilities right on top of the project. Focusing in a little bit closer in on the project yourself, outlined in the in the red and also in the orange, this is kind of that alteration zone, this sort of color outline that we see. So that really is a big part of what drives the program. That's gonna be the focus of exploration 
in the future. The deposit itself sits right at the bottom of the valley. Um, some of these high points, there's quite a lot of topography. Not really much in the way of farmland. Uh, the only reason that anybody ever lived in this area is, uh, is really because of the mining that's historically happened here. This is really just looking at um, a resource grade shells uh, for really what we're doing on this project. So in the purple, we have this very, very high grade, effectively one ounce grade shell on it. Uh, and again, it, it, just like in the PFS, it, it has a very solid core to the inside of this. As you put on the 10 to 31 gram material, again, very consistent throughout it. Uh, and then again, when you put this two to 10 gram material on it, you can see very consistent ore body, uh, something that's really quite easily mineable and easily traceable, uh, and uh, very similar to really what we saw in the PFS. Uh, as we get a little bit more into really how this project is actually going to get mined, uh, we'll just do a quick view of really what that underground development looks like. I'm going to put these grade shells on here again too so you can really see uh, how it interacts with it. Uh, still planned primarily as an underground uh, long hole deposit with some drift and fill on top of it. So in those long hole stopes, you're really seeing this type of material. This is what they're going to really kind of start mining in. So you can see it's really nice, competent material, but again, very, very heavily mineralized. Uh, both on the gold side and on the copper side. Again, here is a nice infill, and you can see um, how rich it is really with that chalcopyrite uh, and pyrite and the sulfides. But as you can see as, as I scroll around here, it's pretty standard, pretty easy. There's nothing really, um, really tricky about really what this layout looks like and certainly leaves uh, the ability to chase after any kind of new resources or exploration upside. That happens from this. So diving right into the economics. This is a very exciting project. You don't see economics like this in the mining industry almost ever. Uh, I've been in this industry over 20 years now and I have not seen a project this robust or ever been associated with a project this robust before. It's, it's very exciting for us. If you look at it, the all in sustaining costs on a byproduct basis, it works out to only $334 an ounce. And if you strip out the copper byproducts and you look at it on a co-product basis, it's still only $595 an ounce, which is an incredibly low cost of operation in the year 2021. This works out to a NAV for the whole project of about 1.3 billion US dollars. On an after-tax basis, it's about 1.05 billion. And with Sandstorm having a 30% profits interest, that works out to just over $300 million uh, of NAV for a world-class investment or asset that Sandstorm now has. You compare that to the $180 million it cost us to purchase this, and we are way, way in the money on this acquisition. It's one we're glad we made, and it's an important part of Sandstorm's growth. One of the things that you don't see very often in the mining industry, and it's actually one of the reasons that Sandstorm exists as a business, is a fast payback period. Mines are expensive to build usually, and usually it takes many years to pay back the capital on the projects. Well, Hod Modern is such a profitable asset that it pays back 100% of its capex in two years, which is amazing. I, I've never seen that before in any project that I've been associated with. Two-year payback on a world-class asset. Over the life of this asset, we expected to produce just over 2.5 million ounces gold equivalent. Now, that does not include any expiration upside. This asset, we believe, has a tremendous amount of expiration upside. And once the, the asset is in construction and starts operating, I believe there's going to be a lot of expiration drilling done to add to the mine life. But for now, this study is done on just those 2.5 million gold equivalent ounces. And you can see here on this chart the breakdown of that. It works out to an average of about 195,000 ounces per year over the mine life. The mine life is 13 years long, and we're expecting it to contribute to Sandstorm's production profile about 60,000 gold equivalent ounces per year, which is a substantial amount of growth for a royalty company like Sandstorm. I've been talking for a long period of time 
about the quality of Hodmodden relative to other projects in the world, and not just average projects, but some of the best projects in the world. And there are a lot of assets out there that produce both copper and gold. And if you look at what the grade of the gold is and the grade of the copper is for those projects, and you compare that to Hodmodden very quickly, it's apparent that Hodmodden separates itself dramatically. You can see on this chart here, on the bottom axis, we've got grams of gold per ton. And on the y-axis, we've got percentage of copper. And compared to a number of these amazing world-class assets, you can see that Hodmodden has both higher grams of gold per ton and a higher percentage copper. And not just by a little bit, by a substantial margin. There are no projects that we can see in the world of any material scale that can stack up to the high grade of gold and copper that Hodmodden has. One of the things that investors know about Sandstorm is that I have focused very purposefully and very hard at building a portfolio of things where the underlying costs of producing gold on an all in sustaining basis is well below average. It's an important part of our business model because it means that at the bottom of the gold cycle, the underlying mines in the portfolio are still making lots of profit and they're healthy. They're investing in exploration at the mines. They're investing in continued capital development and it just makes for a better and more robust business. When you look at Hodmodden compared to the other gold mines in the world, it will be one of the lowest cost producing mines in the entire world. You can see that here on this chart. This is an all in sustaining cost comparison on a byproduct basis. And Hodmodden is, as you can see, one of the lowest cost mines in the world. Now, one of the things that investors have asked me a number of times is because you have bought a 30% profits interest and it's a little bit different than an NSR, how does that fit into Sandstorm's business model? And one of the things that I've been trying to explain so that investors can see why we own this and why it fits perfectly into our portfolio is that typically in a, an NPI type royalty, the underlying mines are producing golds, let's say at $1,000 an ounce. And sometimes you get bad quarters where $1,000 an ounce goes to $1,200 an ounce. If the gold price were to pull back at the bottom of the cycle, closer to $1,200 an ounce, well, your profit becomes zero and your payments in an MPI become zero. That's why we prefer NSRs in our business. Hodmodden though, for example, you can see on this slide is incredibly robust and not at all sensitive to increases in operating costs. You can see on this chart where if you increase the operating costs by 20%, that the overall NAV of the asset decreases by only 6%. Normally, if you increase the operating cost by 20% at a normal mine that has higher operating costs and high capex, the actual NPV of the asset drops by well over 20%. And so in this asset, the payoff profile is very much like a stream. It is not sensitive to increases in the operating costs because the operating costs are already so low. 20% increase on a very low operating cost base isn't very much. And so this asset has a payoff profile to Sandstorm, much like the rest of its streams and royalties in our portfolio. It's the incredible nature and high grade nature of this ore body that makes it so low cost and makes its payoff profile so much like a normal stream. When understanding the economics of this project, you can see that the, the broad economics for calculation of the NPV was run at $1,599 an ounce. Why they didn't round it, <laughs> I don't know, but they didn't. Anyway, what's important to understand though is that there's a difference between the economics that you run the project at for purposes of calculating an NPV and what gold price did you assume when you calculated the actual underlying resource and reserve, which means at higher gold prices, including the gold prices that we ran the economics on, you would actually have more gold ounces in the asset than we're showing currently and therefore you'd have more production over time. This asset has lots of upside, lots of upside in terms of more ounces if the gold price goes higher. We think lots of upside in terms of exploration which is going to be done once the asset is up and running. And so we're really pleased with the low risk, low cost, high upside nature of this asset.
Anytime a feasibility study is released, obviously one of the things that people want to compare it to, as, as do I, is comparing it to the pre-feasibility study that preceded it. And in this case, looking at the all in sustaining operating costs on a co-product basis, you can see that the all in sustaining costs in this feasibility study work out to about $595 an ounce, which is incredibly, incredibly low. The pre-feasibility study showed all in sustaining costs on a co-product basis of about $374 an ounce. And there's really three primary reasons between the all in sustaining costs in the pre-feasibility study and the feasibility study, and they're, and they're fairly basic reasons. The first is there was an increase in the new government royalty that was implemented in Turkey. Turkey had incredibly low royalty rates previously, and the government has I think appropriately acted to more normalize their royalties in line with a lot of the other royalty rates that we see in South America and those types of operations. And so the increase in, in that royalty in government taxes accounts for about $90 per ounce on a co-product basis of that increased costs. So of the $595 that we see in the study per ounce, it would be closer to $500 per ounce if not for the change in the government taxes. And so then if you compare that $500 an ounce to what was in the pre-feasibility study of about $374 an ounce, there's really two remaining areas where that uh, difference is coming from. One is just what you would expect between a pre-feasibility study and a feasibility study, which is when you really start narrowing in on the exact costs and exact quotes, uh, you can start to see some areas where costs are gonna be a little bit higher. So for example, in this study, it was identified that the underground mining costs are gonna be a little bit higher than what was assumed in the pre-feasibility study. And that's a, a normal thing between a, a pre-fees and a feasibility study. And it accounts for approximately half of the difference between the 374 and the $500 an ounce. And the final thing, the final of the three things is that there's just normal inflation. There's been three years between the pre-feasibility study and the feasibility study. And that inflation has to be worked into all of the costs when you release the feasibility study. So this is very much in line with, I think, what one would expect. And we're pleased that as we promised, this asset is showing to be one of the lowest cost, most robust assets with lots of upside out there. When evaluating the quality of an asset, one of the things that you look at, and I've already mentioned this, is how long does it take to pay back the CapEx? And this asset is only a two-year payback. And one of the reasons is not only because it's so high grade, but because it's a pretty simple project to build. And CapEx is, is quite small for a project that's going to be producing this amount of gold. The final CapEx in the feasibility study came in at only $309 million US, which is very much in line with the uh, just shy of $300 million number that we saw in the pre-feasibility study. And the really only difference between the two, again, is just regular normal inflation but over the three years between the two studies. It's an asset that because it's only $309 million in CapEx, the vast majority of that capital is expected to come from regular bank debt financing. So 65, maybe up to 70% of that capital we expect to be bank debt financed. And Sandstorm will have to cut a check for 30% of the, the difference that's not debt financed. Our contribution to this project is only a handful of months of our cash flow. And we expect to be contributing that as they start building the asset. We think some of the long lead construction items will happen towards the end of this year, going into early 2022. And so we plan on, on writing that $32 million check over that period of time. And we're excited to see this asset fast track into production. So in terms of really kind of where we see ourselves on timeline, you can see from this chart, feasibility we've completed, the EIA has been completed and accepted with no public comment on it. We have a few more permits to get in place before construction can begin, but we do expect that to happen by the end of this year and the next year. Another important aspect is the land assembly, most of the way through that, but that should get completed by end of this year and the beginning of 2022. And that allows us to really start that construction period. Some early work starting uh, almost immediately, but the bulk of the construction happening through 20, 
2022 and 2023. Commissioning should begin at the end of 2023 and into 2024 with production starting in the middle of 2024. With this asset going into construction here in the very near term, you can see that the growth that it provides to Sandstorm's portfolio. This is one of those acquisitions that we made at the bottom of the gold cycle while things were down and out and most CEOs were too scared to make acquisitions. And we knew that making an acquisition then would be a lot cheaper than trying to buy an asset at the top of the gold market like we see a lot of our competitors doing. So over the next few years, we have a tremendous amount of growth already built into Sandstorm profile on assets we've already bought with Hod Modern being an important part of that. And sitting here today with absolutely no debt, cash on the balance sheet, and a substantial amount of annual cash flow, we're excited to be able to continue to go out there and grow and buy royalties and buy streams and increase this production profile even sooner.